Good day, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Mark Rohan, Senior Vice President of B2B and Market Research at Digital Commerce 360, and I'd like to kind of thank you for joining us. We have a great place, a great slate of content planned for the session, and we hope, as always, you get a lot out of it. Today, we're going to take on one of the more hotter, in some cases controversial, but certainly evolving topics in all of B2B commerce, which is reaping the value in B2B connected commerce. Connected commerce in B2B e-commerce is red hot and getting hotter. That's because the technology and business strategy driving connected commerce is all focused on letting B2B buyers purchase what, when, how, and where they want and across multiple channels. But critical to getting connected commerce right the first time and every time is having a technology strategy not just the plan, a strategy that takes a look at how to give a truly helpful purchasing experience all across the digital channels, all the touch points that your customers come to you today. And that is the, that is the part and parcel, the gist of connected commerce. So we're going to delve into that very, uh, you know, very uh, coherently and very, very detailed over the course of our next uh, several minutes together. But for instance, uh, we're going to hear the exclusive analysis of a survey that DC360 just did in connection with, uh, with Trade Centrics, looking at where the marketplace stands on this, how far along organizations, organizations tell us they are, and you're going to be the first to hear of what these, uh, of what these findings are. And uh, in just a few weeks, all of this detail that we're shadowing, foreshadowing today on the webinar will be available in a very comprehensive report that both Tradecentric and DC360 will deliver to you. And it's free, it's comprehensive, and we're gonna hit all the highlights today with details in the report to follow. So we are excited to have some real thought leaders today, some real subject matter experts, and uh, we were pleased to welcome uh, Mary Vigil, who is Digital Commerce Operations Leader at Waters Corp. And of course, Tom Roberts, the Chief Marketing Officer of Trade Centric. So, uh, Tom and Mary, would you care to kind of introduce yourself just a little bit? And uh, uh, we'll kind of jump right into the content here, but just tell us a little bit about yourself and, uh, and your roles at, uh, at Trade Centric and with, uh, with Waters. Mary, you want to go first? Sure. Thanks, Mark. Hi, I'm so excited to be here with you today. I'm Mary Vigil. I'm with Waters Corporation. We are a global leader in lab instrumentation and consumables. Um, in my role as the digital operations leader, my team focuses on channel development, customer onboarding, as well as product road mapping and enhancements. Um, as Part of this e-commerce, e-procurement journey, I've been doing this for over 20 years. I've seen it evolve over those 20 years to where it's at today. Excited to share some best practices with you and some of the things I've learned along the way. Thanks. Um, I'm super happy to have Mary on. She's one of our uh, key thought leader customers. So I'm Tom Roberts. As Mark said, I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Trade Centric. Um, I've been here for a little over a year and a half. When I joined, we were still punch out to go. So um, I was the one, and along with a, quite a number of other folks who shepherded us through the process of rebranding to Trade Centric. And even in the time that I've been here, um, the company's a dozen years old, I've watched this whole space evolve dramatically and gotten to spend time with customers like Mary and others in watching their journey. Um, and this survey that we're going to go through and highlight is something that I wanted to do from the first days of me joining because I hadn't seen any real research around some of the things that we're going to show you today. So, and partnering with, with Digital Commerce 360 was critical in pulling that off. So happy to be here. I'm really excited to go through the next hour or so of this. All right. Well, thanks, Mary. Thanks, Tom. And as we're going to jump in, once again, a reminder, the attendees of today's webinar will receive a copy of the report on which the webinar is based understanding B2B supplier e-commerce maturity and digital success. And we break down in great detail beginning just now what that's all about. So some key takeaways from the survey, which we uh, have been looking at the, the last several weeks here. And B2B commerce is growing rapidly with no signs of slowing despite uncertainty. So here's some, here's some color to go with that. 
through the first three through the first six months of the year, uh, manufacturing activity is down. Distribution sales, depending upon the vertical you look at, is down. But across the board, based on Department of Commerce data, it's down. Now, what's not down is B2B e-commerce, and that growth rate is up by 16% in the second quarter compared to 14%, kind of a slower start to the year, and slightly below the 18% where we finished with 2022. So the takeaway is we're seeing less overall sales and manufacturing productivity as the economy slows and business buyers get just a little bit of a, of a hesitancy is fed heading into the next several months here. But aside from that, the growth is a little slower on e-commerce, but still it's growing faster than any other part of the industry here. So uh, let's start with that. Mary and Tom, any observations on how you're seeing the evolution of B2B e-commerce in general from your perspective organizations? Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. We are seeing the same results um, within our business um, as far as you know, comparing it to the normal growth um, that our certain categories would do online. We're seeing higher growth from the digital perspective, um, and that continues to um, you know reach new goals and new um, heights um, even throughout this year when it's been a little bit harder of a year to uh, reach our sales numbers. So what we see, I'm going to talk about it from two different perspectives, Mark and Mary. So we see you know, our existing customer portfolio and what their gross order volume looks like coming through for us, the e-procurement channels, that ordering channel. And we've seen that continue to be very healthy and grow um, throughout the first half of this year. I will say that at the begin at the latter half of last year and then also the first probably several months of this year in terms of new customer acquisition which we we, we bring on quite a number of uh, new customers every year we did see some slowdown in that but we're now seeing that strangely change uh, because i think people were really anticipating a dip, more difficult economic climate than we've actually ended up having and so some of that pent-up demand is starting to uh really loosen up like we're probably going to have our a record month for the month of June uh, this year for new customer acquisition, which means new customers coming on, new suppliers coming on, then bringing on new buyers, et cetera. So I think we're seeing health, healthy growth in both areas. So Tom, I wanna to segue into the second bullet point because we've been talking about this with you folks for a few months now, which is, I mean, the memo's out. B2B commerce has been around for quite some time. It's accelerating across the board holistically faster than I've ever seen it in 20 plus years of doing it. But you know, at the same time, how fast this is rolling out across various verticals is, it, it varies greatly. So can you talk about why you think it is so varied and what are some of the trends driving that, do you think? Well, I think we'll see some specific data on this question that we had in terms of what the supplier um, response was. And just so the folks listening know, we had more than 120 suppliers north america or the us and canada respond to this so a very good sample size across a number of industries and also sizes in terms of revenue of suppliers what i thought this is one of the things that i really wanted us to start measuring and probably do it over time to watch how um, the market matures it's not a surprise it's almost like a bell curve um, or a normal distribution and you've got people in varying degrees of maturity in terms of how they are really thinking about and investing in their overall e B2B e-commerce presence. I think that's the case having to do with, for one thing, industries, certain industries are more advanced. And because if, if you're in an industry segment that's advancing rapidly, like life sciences, like Mary's industry, you, know, you have to stay up and competitive with your competitors or you fall behind. Um, other areas are probably a little less so. We also work with a number of distributors or smaller distributors. That's more a traditional sort of approach to the business. So I think it really is doesn't surprise me that these are sort of spread across a variety of different of responses of where they are in the maturity curve. So Mary, I want to kind of talk to you about our third bullet point here because it's, it's, it's a very important one. But you know, holistically, you know, since we kind of measure the swath of things at DC 360, you know, yeah, the memo is out for too long now that buyer behavior changed mildly during the during the, the pandemic. What's not clear is just how fast that change came about, 
who's driving the change and driving trends like connected commerce. So from Water's perspective, can you kind of talk about what are you seeing in terms of changing purchasing behavior? And are, are you seeing folks in your space being more aggressive to maintain competitive positions? So what are you seeing from your perspective there, do you think? Yeah, um, it's kind of a mixed bag, to be honest, Mark. Um, what we, we see a variety. We see customers demanding more options to purchase, where some want to do it from the marketplace, others want to do it direct. Um, we have customers that are still, as I would put it, very well trained at the manual process with us that we're trying to retrain to be more digitally minded. Um, so we have kind of variety that we're trying to serve and find ways to serve. Um, I think um, there's so many options out there and folks are being trained in their personal life in a way um, to have to take advantage of some of those options that they're bringing that experience with them into the B2B. And we're trying to quickly identify and adapt to that because there's so many more requirements that we need to serve a B2B customer um, than what is being done in the B2C world. Okay, well, let's advance to our next slide and then take a look at some of the, uh, some of the findings here that we're, we're, that we're gonna analyze over the course of our time together. Okay, so what, what's, what's interesting here, I think, is that companies are kind of evenly divided about who's been at it for quite some time versus who's rather new at it. So any surprises here, Tom and Mary, that you see from your perspective? To me, it just shows the point Tom's made, which is there's a great deal of diversity with the maturing curve, which we'll talk about in just a minute here. But any thoughts on this slide, Tom and Mary? Uh, I'll, let me kick this off. Like one of the observations that I've got, and you're thinking about, you mentioned it, Mark, um, what the pandemic did. If you go back, that's now we're, we're close to four years into that whole process and look at the, the biggest slice of this pie, if you will, is the three to five year maturity in terms of longevity. I think what you had is a lot of people, the business, the world changed dramatically and people hustled like crazy to get online if they weren't online. And that's probably why that 40% is there. Now, the question is how far are they advancing and continue to advance dependent upon how they are competitive in their specific industry segments or not. So that three to five at 40% is not a surprise for me because of that. But I do think it's interesting that more than half who are really invested in this, you know, six years and longer, and that's not a surprise. We really have been, you know, working on this for decades, and um, that's also not necessarily a surprise. What about what about your your vertical, Mary? I mean, you know, holistically, I just offered a few tidbits and so did Tom, but specifically within, you know, the vertical for water space, are you seeing what? You know the companies that you do business with or frankly compete against are you seeing it evenly split or are you seeing a little more advanced or unadvanced depending upon uh, uh, your market perspective yeah so i think um it's pretty evenly split i think there's some definitely more mature in our space and others that are about in the same spot we are in we've actually been doing this for more than 10 years However, I would say that within the last three to five years is when we've actually truly seen benefits from it, seen um, the program ramp up, um, made more digital investments in the program, um, and really been able to get our customers' attention, as well as our customers are demanding it. So they're coming to us saying, this is the only way we can buy from you. You need to be able to serve us in this way. Okay, well, let's go to our next slide and we're gonna kind of take a look at the maturity curve here. So here is basically what we came up with as to look at the four different evolution stages of, of B2B commerce leading to full-blown connected commerce. And we have one through four. So Tom, you wanna kind of take us through, you know, kind of the evolution, the, the, the evolution of the stages here? Sure. So, so let me just explain one of these quickly. So e-commerce 1.0, look, they've invested in B2B commerce and they're working on migrating people away from, you know, manual ordering to be more dependent upon e-commerce. That's the first step in the process. We'll have another slide later about, I would call it order type dispersion and the amount of dispersion. And Mary, Mary touched on this earlier. It's still, despite the growth in e-commerce, it's still, there's a lot of manual ordering. 
um, not just for people that are in Ecom 1.0, Ecom 2.0, fully adopted e-commerce, but they don't have customization to have things like inventory and specific, specific prices for um, customers, specific customers. So we've got 37% of the population in the first two buckets. The middle, and if you, I mentioned earlier, a bell curve or normal distribution, if you, that's on the side, if you flip that up like this, that's exactly what this more or less is. 28% are sort of in this middle segment of e-commerce 3.0, where they have successfully established their e-commerce platform as the primary channel, but there's a lot of EDI, there's probably a lot of hosted catalog and other things. And there's also not mentioned here, you know, also a lot of manual ordering. As Mary mentioned, we've trained folks to be good at manually ordering. You get to e-commerce 4.0 and then finally connected commerce. That's when they're starting to recognize a certain type of buying behavior shift. And that's the buyers starting first with very large enterprises and then now certainly moving healthily into the mid-market are implementing e-procurement solutions to control spend, understand spend, et cetera. And why is that important? Because they want those purchasers using those solutions to buy, but then e-commerce is other place that they are trying to buy. So that's really starting to connect those two systems together. And you got about 35% of the respondent population in those two segments. So- Mary, can you talk, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Tom, sorry. No, that's it, I'm good. Mary, can you talk about where you where you where where are you at from the water's perspective? I mean, can you kind of if you were one, two, three, and four, can you kind of talk about your present where you, where presently you folks are at? So we're definitely in the connected commerce. We have end-to-end -end solutions for from both an e-procurement standpoint as well as an e-commerce standpoint, um, and we have fully matured our e-procurement suite in partnership with Trade Centric to help us with that. Um, they were the, the, the pivotal piece that we needed to complete that evolution. What we see from that is the benefit of efficiency and our customers' ability to integrate with us in a way they expect to. So when they come to us and knock on the door and ask, you know, we'd like to do an integration with you, it's not oh, sure, we'll do punch out with you. It's no, what would you like to do? We can do everything and we prefer to do all of it um, as part of an integration. And now I think you mentioned you, your journey is not new. You've been out of for, I think, what, a decade? Was that what you, the, 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 the span yeah. you mentioned? Yeah. Could, you know, yeah. So yeah. for some perspective, you know, for the attendees uh, on the webinar, you know, that are kind of listening in today, would you talk about the timeline from, I mean, was it, I mean, how long from one to two to three to four? Because you've got 10 years, which is quite a history there. But I mean, were some gestation periods, you know, to the next level faster, slower than others? A little perspective on that, if you would. Yeah, so I'd say, um, you know, from the e-procurement standpoint, we, we, we had a solution. Um, it wasn't like a, a fully baked solution, but we utilized it when we needed to. It was kind of an as-needed basis. Um, we also... Um, had an e-commerce site, but again, it wasn't exactly what met everyone's needs. And so the two finally came together um, right before COVID um, and they are now a full, full suite offering. It's been about three to four years in the making. All right. Now, if I had Jeopardy music going, I'd play it now, but I don't. So we're all gonna play some little Jeopardy music here. So it's time for a poll question audience. And we're gonna ask you, where we think you're at. So uh, keep in mind, we're gonna ask you to kind of vote on four to five distinct uh, distinct uh, levels here. So Ecom One, invested in e-commerce and migrating customers from manual ordering. Ecom Two, fully adopted e-commerce site but lack buyer customization. Ecom Three, e-commerce is the primary ordering channel. EDI is also prominent. Ecom Four, beginning to kind of transact with buyers in native uh, e-procurement solution, also offering hosted catalogs. And then uh, the final map of the journey here, the final leg, connected commerce, offer full integration with customers, e-procurement, with punch out, purchase order, and invoice automation. So why don't we take a quick poll here and we'll see how our audience stacks up against what we're finding with some of our, our, our results here. So let's take the poll.
and I hear that Jeopardy music even as we even as we uh, not chat here. So, okay. Well, can we see the results? Okay. Well, this is interesting. This is really interesting because uh, Tom, this goes right back to the heart of one of the main points I think you made just a few minutes ago, which is we're seeing some real some real uh, uh, segmentation with the uh, with the maturity rates here. So nobody's uh, nobody's just getting going, but only the 50% are at Ecom2, which I guess is kind of interesting. But my takeaway here is look at the companies, almost 40% of those in the audience today saying they believe they're right there with Waterscore for full connected commerce. So uh, let's kind of give a little, little sound bite there. What, what's your take on this, Tom? And then Mary, what's your take on this as well, do you think? Tom first. Um, that's, it's surprising. I think we've got um, with 38% in the, the most advanced bucket, we've got a fairly advanced audience pool, a um, little more advanced than our sample of 123 um, companies. That's great to see. Um, and on the 50% that's it, 2.0, I'd really be interested in having some conversations saying, okay, are you working really to advance that? How much, you know, what are the, what are the blockers in your organization and other things that are, you know, things that we talk with our customers about, you know, with Mary in particular, having moved through this, you know, there's a lot of work that has to be done to get internal buy-in and other things for the investments required, both in team and technology. So um, pretty interesting poll results. Mary, what's your takeaway? Yeah, I would definitely agree. I mean, I think I find that with, um, you know, Ecom 2 and 3, that is typically where you get to the evolution where you tend to pause um, and need more investment, right, to make the leap into e-procurement and, and to begin to take that on as well. You also need the justification. You know, what is the benefit? How many customers are we talking about? You know, what is the cost of this? Um, and you know what does it really mean for us? Um, how do we grow our business with e-procurement? And that was the piece that um, I think is it's the most challenging, but it's also the most exciting because you really begin to uncover um, what opportunity is out there and present that to your higher level leadership. You know, the, from a macro perspective, that 38% surprises me, but it does not astound me only because the, the rapid adoption of digital first customers has been so pronounced over the last two years, it's basically B2B commerce on steroids, if you wanna use, if you, if you use that term, because that has been the case. Buyers today, which reflect a younger demographic uh, that prefer e-com and, and self-service to the old fashioned uh, paper and manual systems, what they want, they want it and they want it now. So I'm not surprised at that, but uh, I wanna circle back to our next slide here with, with this observation, which is I am convinced that a lot of sellers are struggling with some of the things we're talking about here, advancing through the, uh, advancing through the, uh, uh, the ranks to get to con connected for. I think that's where the, where the, what some of the disconnect is. So, but anyway, let's talk about some of the growth here, Tom. Are you surprised that 90% of the company survey experienced some kind of growth over the past 12 months, despite their level of e-commerce maturation? What do you think about that? No, I think it's a natural gravitational pull, you know, of, of trying to order in the most efficient way possible. Um, you know, I think that's the uh, interesting takeaway from this, you know, over the last 12 months, 90% of respondents were all up and to the right. And then if you really look at the two leftmost bars here, uh, north of 60% were 11% growth or better, and about almost, you know, 20% of the population is 25% growth or better. So very healthy, and not surprising. We see this, you know, through our own statistics as well. Um, I think you've got to be working at it if you're flat to down, because of the natural gravitational pull of it's just more efficient to order through this set of channels than to order online, even though there's still a lot of online ordering. Mary, to the extent that, you know, you can talk about, you know, some of the things you're seeing from a growth perspective at Waters, 
where do you think where do you see waters fitting in with some of the with some of the the, the, the numbers we're seeing here? I mean, is it completely counter to what you're experiencing, or I don't know, maybe you're growing twice as fast, or maybe you saw a huge spurt coming out of COVID, but then now it's been a little more back to normal. So, could you give a little color on on how you folks compare? Yeah, I mean, we're right in line here, here with these with these results. I would completely agree, um, and I would also add that when you're easier to do business with, they're going to buy more. I mean, if customers are going to spend more. When you make investments in your shopping experience um, that again, put tools at their fingertips that they're used to using in their personal lives with the personal orders they make online, again, you're easier to do business with and it just makes for a better overall experience. So they're gonna come back and they're gonna order um, again and again, and they're going to order more because why not? I'm here already. I might as well add a few more of those items that I was going to maybe order from someone else or somewhere else, but it's just easier to do it all with you. You know, one of the reasons I love talking to, you know, the good folks at Trade Centric is because they've got what I think is one of the most unique views of holistic data across all the B2B commerce spectrum. You know, there's a lot of platform companies or a lot of or a lot of uh, other companies, they're kind of like market market basket snapshots of what they think their data tells them, and then they kind of ex extrapolate their findings from there. That's not uncommon. What is very uncommon, I think, Tom, is the fact that you have one of the fastest growing channels, e-procurement, up 18% last year by our count. Most of those, most of that transaction volume is flowing through what I call your pipeline. So you've got a pretty good data view of the world from where you sit at Trade Centric. So my question to you is, given the fact that you can see the data, I mean, volumes of data running through the, that e-procurement pipeline of yours, I want to refer back to the maturation rate of connected commerce as it relates to this e-commerce maturity level. So because it is anywhere, any way I want it, do you see any of that trend reflected in these numbers? In other words, connected commerce, do you see that as a driver of these trends here? Or you think that is a driver for future uh, uh, future future sales results? No, and I, if the, look, if, you're, if your customers are using e-procurement solutions and more and more are, and you're providing connectivity that supports what the CFO, and the chief procurement officer and the lieutenants in purchasing want, which is visibility to spend and control and everything else, which basically means allowing e-procurement to talk to e-commerce solutions. Overall, as Mary said, if you're making it easier for them to do business with you, you're going to you're going to end up doing more business with them. And we see that we've done various studies associated with that. We see that in our own data. We're growing faster, way faster than the 18 percent that you talked about. Um, even with our existing customer base, not adding new customers. So overall, it's a very healthy channel that's probably as you know certainly in the rightmost, the little leftmost versions of this this chart in terms of the bar charts. Mary, when 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 you folks feel like you achieve the level of connected commerce, could you talk just a little bit about about how that where that came from? In other words, it was inside out to the market. In other words, you decided that this was the way your customers were going but therefore you had to kind of take internally you know the, the 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 strategic priority and make the investment to kind of achieve connected commerce or just the opposite your customers told you knock knock waters we want this so uh who drove the bus in in kind of getting you to that level of what you would call connected commerce i, I think it was a combination of factors it wasn't one single factor that got us there it was a combination that we used to build the business case and present to leadership as to why this was the right investment here is you know the industry trends that we're seeing um here is what my experience has been in this industry for 20 plus years and doing this and you know how it just can't go wrong um, and then also interviewing customers that were asking for it and, you know, trying to uncover more about what their goals were, what their plans were, how we can further establish that key partner relationship with them by being part of um, this integration and these catalogs that they're going to then have available to their 
ordering or they're buying groups. Um, and when you're part of that, again, you're there and you're present where they're looking for you. When you're not, you're harder to do business with. Um, I tell our sales folks all the time that if we're not there, then we're probably like the third or fourth phone call they're making to find it because it's, we're not easy, right? So it's like, oh, I'll try easy first. And then if I can't get it there, then I'll, I'll try maybe another catalog, but then I'll start calling around. So we want to be easy. We want to be where they expect us. You know, uh, my apologies to George Orwell here, but you know what? I got to tell you, I think some pigs, some e-commerce pigs are more equal than others. And what I mean by that is this. Yes, we're seeing faster growth along the uh, along the uh, the pipeline here holistically. But I think what we're seeing at DC 360 is the fact that it's not just the race to mature the uh, the uh, uh, what level of connectivity you're at going for connected commerce. It's basically how fast you can accelerate and get there. Because truly, in market after market, vertical after vertical, this becoming the haves. And the have-nots. Let's go to our next slide. And I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you why that is, and then we're gonna kind of see this. So, for instance, six of ten companies report that 21% of their customers are asking for e-procurement integration. So, that's a prime example, I think, of customers coming to whoever the B2B seller might be, saying, "We want this delivered to us." So, Tom, what do you think about about that driver? the fact that 60% are saying we want this as to how that accelerates the whole connected commerce equation of things. What do you well, think? I think? I think, yes, this is, this is this slide plus the prior slide and the data on, you know, where people are in the maturity. I think you juxtapose those two things. And that's where I think the most interesting, one of those interesting things in the survey for me and for trade centric comes across one, you've got six in 10 companies saying, Hey, 21% or more of my clients are asking for this. And then if you go back a couple slides and don't, you don't have to go back on the maturity, you had about 35% of the population who's responding. So what to me that says is there's, there's a gap. There's a gap between what customers are asking for. And if you've invested in Coupa or Ariba or Jagger or Ivalua or Birch Street, you know, your CPO and C CFO wants that used. And if you exit out of that and use e-commerce natively and use a card to check out, you're kind of off the grid. So what I think is happening here is you've got a disconnect and a pulling apart of where customer buying behavior is and is maturing. And you've got people trying to catch up to that. Um, and we say that all the time in, in, in our prospect base, people who come in saying, okay, there's a tipping point where they have enough customers who are now demanding for these connectivity solutions and they can't slow roll it anymore. So it's not surprising. What are your thoughts, are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I would say from our standpoint, um, we're probably over in the more than 50% of our customers are asking for e-procurement. Um, we get a lot of inquiries about it. However, based on capacity and resources and you know, really how we're looking at what we can do from a volume standpoint, we're probably closer to the 21 to 30%. So we fall into that, that, that higher bar. Um, we are looking down the road to, uh, for ways to how we can evolve our program. So we can take on more and accommodate more and have more options within our toolbox um, to serve those. Um, but at the moment where we're, where we're at is probably that, that 34% of, you know, trying to serve you know as many as we can and get the the biggest um impact from that work you know one obvious one obvious takeaway for anybody who is listening to this webinar or who is engaged in you know the the whole practice of b2b commerce is that we are not and i stress that we are not talking about the next big thing this is real this is happening there's going to be winners there's going to be losers so we're gonna kind of delve into a little more holistically in just a slide here about what it looks like from the, what exactly Connected Commerce breaks down to. But Tom, here's my question to you. Uh, I have been watching e-procurement evolve from say, I don't know, five or six years ago to what could have been maybe a minor commerce sales channel 
important to those who had it, but still, you know, it was nowhere near the, the growth rates you see on just that kind of pure e-commerce side. That's all changed. In the last year, you know, our forecast at DC360 was that last year, more than a trillion dollars, and maybe your numbers are bigger, but I counted a trillion growing at 18% a year going through e-procurement. E so the takeaway from our macro numbers was that e-procurement is not just a fast growing channel, it's sometimes one, sometimes two, and the fastest growing channel. So having framed that, and the fact that 21% here, or 60% are asking for advanced e-procurement, what role does e-procurement play in driving connected commerce? Part of the journey, accelerates the journey, is the journey. What do you think? It really is the journey. I mean, it, and it's been the journey for more sophisticated, larger suppliers. Um, who, I mean, we're not the only game in town, right? There, there are some very large organizations that have been investing in this and in e-procurement integrations and connectivity for their large, sophisticated customers for a decade, right? So some very large ones doing it their own with a big practice. So I'm not going to name them, but you know who you are, you're out there, and I know who you are too. So this is this has been a an area where um, there's been a fair amount of investment, but it's been focused sort of on the high end of the buying segment, but it's been shifting over time as procurement, and that was, if you, Coop is now private, but if you're sort of watching Coupa's earnings releases, they're pushing from large enterprise into middle market from indirect spend into direct spend really over the last five years, and same thing with others. So I think it's becoming a much more prominent sort of preferred channel for various different buying segments. And certain e-commerce or certain suppliers with e sophisticated e-commerce capabilities have been responding more and more and greatly, people like Waters. Hey, Mary, if I had a beer, I'd go like this. You know, if you ask a very thoughtful question, maybe I can't anyway, you tell me. But here's my question for Waters, which is, in terms of the role that e-procurement plays in the Waters' completed journey towards connected commerce, can you give some color on that? Same question, the driver, big driver, it all began, it all began with, and, all, and the be with all is e-procurement as it relates to what you're doing and your view of connected commerce. What do you think? So I would say it's a big driver. Um, it really plays a role, especially in partnership with our sales team. Um, with you know, with our e-commerce site, they spend a lot of time herding cats, if you will, making sure everyone's registered, everyone's using it, and no one's having any problems with it. With e-procurement, it's almost what we call a one-stop shop, where um, once we're connected. It kind of does. It helps gather the cats um, for them, so they're not um, having to go out and do that as much. It's more of a conversation around: Have you seen our catalogs now available, or is there anything you know particular you were working on, or you have plans for, so they can start talking about the future and potentially what projects they're going to be working on, and have higher level, elevated conversations with their contacts. Um, so again, they can work in partnership with it a little bit easier um, with less tactical work to get there. All right, and let's kind of take a look at our next slide here and kind of kind of further that theme here if we could. So, you know, Tom, as we mentioned at the start of the, uh, of the at the start of the webinar here, and something that you and I and the team have been talking about as we put together the white paper, which by the way, is free to all attendees in just a few weeks after the webinar here, as well as through distribution through you know, Trade Centric and DC360. It's not just one channel that makes up connected commerce, it's multiple channels. But the end result here is that buyer out there, how do they see connected commerce? Very simply, I want to use whatever digitally driven channel I want, how I want it, in the best way to make my job, easier, faster, and more efficient. So having said that, uh, what do you think of this takeaway, Tom? At least half the B2B companies are doing business in most channels. So uh, uh, par for the course, a little surprising here. What's your take on the data here? Well, we hear this from our client advisory board and our client advisory board's very important to us that you know they're investing a lot in e-commerce and in the e-procurement channel, but as Mary said, you know, 
buyers have also been trained to you know order manually for for quite a while and what's i guess when i saw this result i actually felt sorry for suppliers because they have to support so many different channels and try and deliver a consistent experience across a profusion of different ways that people are buying and ideally you're trying to shift them as much as possible to the most efficient channels if you look at the third bar call center or customer service and then the last bar email or fax i mean those are very expensive channels uh, but it's hard to wean people off of these there's probably is some overlap however in terms of things like sales rep because in certain industries, sales reps are very important, but the sales rep is trying to get the companies or their customers to order through either e-procurement or directly on e-commerce. So there's probably some other data things in this going on where it's not as not necessarily as bad as this looks, but eesh, if you're a supplier, you're trying to support a lot of different methodologies. So Mary, what, what's your take on this? I mean, uh, uh, Connected commerce could also be maybe tangentially referred to just a little bit about omnichannel, but you know, that's a that's a kind of a trite term. It's been around forever. My question is probably at DC 360, on average, maybe three to five channels for how a customer might connect for, you know, with some kind of supplier, if you will. McKinsey uh, has sometimes as many as seven. They think the average uh, on the high end could be up to 10. So what about waters here? How many channels realistically come across from your connected commerce uh, program, do you think? Yeah, great question. I think this pretty much sums up the list. I can't think of too many other ways they get they find us. Um, this is pretty much it. Um, if you combine marketplaces and, and distributors. Um, so yeah, what, what I would say here is it, it's a couple of things. Um, one is brand. Um, so where they're learning about your brand, um, and it could be any one of these places, right? And so you want to be sure your brand is represented accordingly um, and that you're not left out. Um, and so sometimes that does mean playing in the right marketplace. It doesn't mean playing in all of them, but it could mean um, playing in the right ones for brand awareness. Um, it also means identifying who your key customers are um, where those key partnerships are and establishing that direct relationship with them because that will help you um, rein them in to a degree in how you'd like them shopping and buying and invoicing with you. Um, the last thing that I'll say, and you know, Tom touched on it, is you know, that omni-channel experience from our standpoint is huge. We spend a tremendous amount of time thinking about our product roadmap and what we can do to better serve that omni-channel and that experience that customers expect. It is a much more difficult lift in the B2B world. Um, there's many more components to that from beginning to end that we have to be sure we're gathering the right information and we're serving it up in a very consistent manner. Um, but that's our overall goal. And when you're looking at so many different channels, um, it, it can become um, a bit overwhelming. We're utilizing technology to kind of help us serve that. I got to tell you, I think uh, if we were to do the same survey out here, maybe in just as little as 24 months, I think that a lot, you see a lot less manual and a lot more maybe 70s for those top four or five bars, if you will. But there are three fundamental stools, uh, parts to the puzzle, if you will, for connected commerce. One, of course, is the technology and the technology infrastructure. Two is the strategy to do this. And three is, of course, figuring out the voice of who wants this, which is, you know, your connected customer who wants to kind of do business with you in a lot of ways. I want to talk about two and three for just a sec. So, Tom, as you look at these multiple channels here, how do you figure out for your organization, whatever that might be, what is the strategy for connected commerce? And then one step further, once you have the strategy, if you have to reach all these customers across all those channels, how do you give voice to that? How do you make sure you're meeting those demands? So I, I think it's really how do you simplify the business, right? And how do you concentrate and move customers to preferred, more efficient, 
and profitable channels and out of expensive manual channels. That I mean, that has to be part of the strategy. And not all customers are using e-procurement, right? So my, there still may be requirements for um, other channels. It's not like that's all that's going to take. <laughs> that's going to be it. But in general, I think this graph says if I'm the if I'm a CFO or if I'm the chief strategy officer, what I'm trying to do is figure out how do I simplify this and simplify the business and push my clients and prospects into the most efficient channels as, and you know honestly as effectively as possible. And you do that by giving them a better and better experience and maybe better pricing or other things that all sort of drive to a better overall margin level and efficiency state. Mary, can you offer the Waters perspective on this, which is, you know, you, you, we talked about, I mean, it's the technology, the infrastructure, that's, of course, very important. That's, that's the first part of the, uh, the first leg of the stool. But what about, from your perspective, the strategy of connected commerce has to include what? And then once you have the strategy, how do you execute across all the multiple channels we're talking about here to make sure that you're hearing your, the voice of your customer, which is basically, I want to do business with you, how I want to do business with you, do it. So what do you think about that? Yeah, so I think one of the main pillars for us was data, ensuring you are aligned with your data um, both from a cleansing standpoint, as well as a reporting and analytics standpoint, and really understanding your customer's behavior and how how they're going to business, how they're doing business with you today. Um, once you have your arms around that, then I think the next strategy and the next step really is um, to focus on where there are manual parts. And why are there manual parts? So what is the why behind why they're calling customer service? Or what's the why? Could we answer that with um, an e-commerce solution? Is there a piece missing from the website that we need to add? Um, what could we do to further enhance that experience? Um, you know, right there in the middle is sales representation at 51%. And we're probably as guilty with that as anyone else is. Um, I'm not going to try and shy away from it. Our sales reps are very intimately involved with their customers. They understand their customers' needs, and they're there to serve them in any way they need to. We're really trying to help them elevate to the point where their customers are comfortable utilizing these digital tools, going there, and utilizing them as more of a resource to working on projects together, working on gathering information about um, new um, you know, projects that we have coming down um, the pipeline from a product perspective. Um, and so they can, again, elevate those conversations that they're having. Um, and then the last thing is, again, having the right amount of um, what I call collateral, different types of marketing collateral that really help um, sell um, your digital strategy, your digital platforms, your digital connection capabilities, um, the ability to um, have sales go out and have those conversations in a really simple way. Um, that we're not talking super technical here, we're talking very simple, um, and it really walks them through the different steps of the conversation with the answers right there. So if the customer does have a question, um, it's right there. They can kind of go through the, the different um, options that might be available. Okay, let's go to our next slide. We're kind of going, we're kind of coming around the bend here. So, platform is a top priority in budgets for six to ten businesses, and I don't, I'm not surprised by that, but it kind of tells me just how important, you know, the wall opening is here. So, Tom, what are your thoughts about about the platform and the priority existence as we see in our data here? What's your takeaway from that? So a couple of things. One, I think when we saw, you know, the, the pandemic change, how people were thinking about selling, you had a lot of people thinking about upgrading their existing commerce platforms. So you had people moving from older, more antiquated platforms to more modern platforms. And we're partners with everybody in that space. So we, you know, we get referrals on that quite a bit. That seems to have slowed down. Um, it had, well, it doesn't seem it has slowed down and that's we see that data from a number of different places as the, as the economy got more uncertain that's a big ticket item not just for the platform switch but also for professional services so it makes sense that platform switching as that slows down that the budget is moving toward 
investing in the existing platforms, upgrading that, upgrading the experience, and um, not so much taking the big lift of moving from you know, e-commerce platform A to e-commerce platform B. So not particularly surprising. Any thoughts on the platform migration here, just in general, uh, Mary? You know, I would just add that I think this is very representative of what we're trying to do to meet customer requirements and have technical solutions to solve for those. Um, I think that's like a priority for most um, at this point in the game, especially since COVID. Um, and a lot of times if you can utilize technology in the right way, it helps for you to repurpose um, some of your, your folks that are doing some of those tacti that tactical work today to do um, you know, more revenue generating tasks. And then let's go to our final slide here. So I, I want to talk about, you know, we have gone through a lot of data, Tom and Mary, and I think one of the big, big takeaways here is that we are not talking about some what if, nice to have, could be happening to a bigger guy but not like me type of uh, phenomena here. This is the fast moving evolution maturation of connected commerce as it relates to digital commerce and buyers doing business with sellers day in, day out. So my question to you, Tom, is after going through the data here with our audience and with the report to come, what are some of your takeaways for where people should be thinking about this from the perspective of where they are? I mean, boy, we better get going. Uh, it's time to go check with the customer. What are some just top line takeaways from what the data tells you organizations should be thinking about from all walks of life? What do you think? Well, it's a combination of the data plus also spending a lot of time with prospects and our customers. I mean, part of it really is to understand how are your buyers buying if you're a supplier, right? So um, just met recently with a, a very large chemical company. There's a lot of EDI. It's sort of the way things are moving, but middle market customers, probably are moving more and more toward using procurement solutions. So understanding that and understanding it's, it, you know, it's what we do is not a fit for everybody, but in general, I think it comes down to understanding who is your customer base? What are their preferences? What are their requirements? And what does it take for you to respond to them so that you really become the, as you know, as Mary said, you're the easy button, right? You're the easiest one to do business with because that is going to be able to, help you basically grow the top line and the bottom line. Well, on, on that vein, can you explain more about the detail, about the benefits of moving from e-commerce 3.0 to connected commerce? Well, again, it presupposes, it has to presuppose if there's a benefit about how your customers are buying. If your customers, and we found, we found prospects and customers who are really not adept at getting in and talking to their customers about how they're, buying and what their procurement processes are and sort of getting good at that is one thing and it's also training as mary mary uh touched on this the corporate account sales team to have those discussions and understand being articulate about okay asking do you have coupa how do you use it etc but if they're if your customer base has moved in that direction or is moving the benefits are are substantial because the return on investment of, in, of implementing solutions that support how a customers want to buy, customer wants to buy, you know, is significant. Mary has talked about that for us in other places. You'll see increases of existing customers and then also for customers or prospects that are buying using the procurement and issuing RFPs and that's a key requirement. And if you don't have it, you can't respond. That allows you to respond to somebody who actually is implementing. So there's a lot of well, growth. Can, can you follow up on, on Tom's point? And can, can you talk about some of the biggest benefit that you've seen at Waters from offering full end-to-end -end integration? So I think for us, um, a big piece of it's been the efficiency and our ability to um, connect them to an online catalog that has items with availability so they can see exactly what items are available and will be shipped. So if they have certain needs to get it in a certain time frame, especially when you know items were hard to get for a while, um, that was super important. So they can see that, they understand that, it's one less phone call to customer service. 
hey, am I going to get this on time or not? You know, what's what's the timing on it? Um, they get those answers right in our catalog. They know that. They also know the item is a valid item. <laughs> it's good. They can order it um, and they've got the right pricing. They can see their pricing. Um, so those are really key benefits for us in eliminating some of those phone calls to customer service, as well as, again, serving them in a way that they would like to be served. Um, other benefits have been all the way through the invoicing process, where we're able to send them an invoice that loads into their system. They're able to send it through the proper approvals and pay us faster. Um, so it's a win-win for all of us um, when that happens. Um, there are benefits to just the overall growth that we see. Um, it's just the, it's the natural um, channel to grow, um, and we're seeing that during um, a, you know, a little bit of a tougher economy. Um, it's easier for our sales reps because, again, they're able to then elevate their conversations with their customers. They're seen as more, not just an, a lab and a chemistry expert, but now they're also that can add the digital aspect to it. They're also the digital as, uh, expert um, in their customers' eyes. Um, so anytime you can be more of an expert in your customers' eyes, I think that's a good place to be. Um, and, and then uh, as well as identifying the direct piece too. And here is kind of our summary question. We have about two minutes left here, which is uh, how do you prioritize which customers to start with? <laughs> oh yeah, that, that's a great one. So, you know, you can't boil the ocean in, in a day. And so what I recommend is really taking a look at your customer base and identifying who are those key customers. More than likely those customers you identify already have some sort of e-procurement solution that they need to integrate with you on. Um, and if not, it's worth just asking them, like what are their plans for e-procurement? Do they have plans um, to go that direction? Um, they'll provide really good input and insight into that that will help you evaluate how quickly you need to react um, to those needs. And Tom, the final up, the floor is yours for the final words. So what do you think about what are some of your wrap-up thoughts and what do you think about how to prioritize this for a customer base across uh, a seller organization? Well, I, I'll say this. So we have, you know, we have connected so many suppliers to so many buyers. We've got approaching 5,000 um, companies in our network. So we've been at this for a while and it continues to grow. I'll be honest, some buyers are easier to work with than others. Um, so in addition to understanding who's available to start with this, if you're just starting a program, I mean, we can provide quite a bit of advice on, okay, here's here, here are places where we know we can help and get quick wins, and here's where we should sort of work our way toward. I met with a, a customer last week that's just starting out on this, and they're trying to prioritize one of the most difficult ones that we have connections with, but we know they're challenging to work with so there's both a technology component to this as well as a um, cultural component so we can provide quite a bit of advice around okay here's the best places to start and how to progress well with that i want to thank tom i want to thank mary i want to thank all of our attendees for today's uh, webinar attendance and don't forget all attendees receive a new survey report from trade center and dc 360 and we thank you for your time uh, look for this in your inbox in a few weeks thank you for attending